Good afternoon to you. Welcome to U105. It's Carolyn here with you until... Three o'clock today. Uh, most people, whenever they um, they have their life savings and they retire, they maybe do a wee bit of gardening, uh, maybe take themselves for a wee trip somewhere, maybe by a caravan. But not my next guest. My next guest decided he wanted to go and explore um, and find the world's largest snake. Let me welcome to you 105 Mike Warner and his son Greg Warner. Welcome both of you to you 105 It's good to see you. Thank you. Hi, Carolyn. Do you know what? I've just been talking, but just before you guys come in, about the fact that you have pictures, you've taken pictures. You went to find this mythical giant anaconda and it was 40 metres. And everybody's been texting me going, you've got that wrong. It's got to be uh, 40 metres is 130 feet. That can't be right. It must be 40 feet. Tell me, Mike, was it 40 metres or 40 feet? 40 metres. And there's even one down there that's even bigger than that. 40 metres. I can't even imagine. The pictures that you have here, Mike, mm. um, actually, there's one of it where the head of the snake is at one side of a, a river stroke swamp and the body is way on down yeah. somewhere else. The head could be two metres across. It's but, that big. Unbelievable. Well, first of all, how did you get interested in anacondas? When did it all start well, for you? It started many years ago. I saw a picture of a python from India. Somebody had gone hunting. They put a goat out. And this python, had cut, they were after tigers naturally, but they, the, uh, this python came in and swallowed a goat. And I saw this strange picture of a goat with about eight men, the, the snake with, put, with the horns punched through the side of the, uh, the snake oh and God. about carried by eight people on their shoulders. And I thought, I just wondered how big snakes could really get. <laughs> yes. That's what started it. So that's got, your, got you interested. And then did you just read up on it? Or what, what did you do about it? Well, I read ancient... Uh, Stuff like uh, you find things like uh, the apocryphal writings of the Jews Mm -hmm. went into that. I went into ancient uh, folklore and stories and things like that that uh, led me to... I even found um, an ancient Babylonian seal, uh, which uh, had a description. I was able to decipher it and what it meant, Mm -hmm. what it was trying to tell me, and it was about really a big, huge snake. Yes. So this way we were able to progress. It sort of triggered say, one thing triggered another until we I ended up where I am, you know. <laughs> right. So so you, you you finish your work and you're you're retiring and you've got all your savings and you decide what do you do? Do you think to yourself, right, okay, I'm gonna actually go and try and see one of these snakes? No, well, what I I had all this information, you see, gathered over the years, over about twenty years. Mm-hmm. And uh, then my son looked at it all and he said, you know, you're gonna have to follow this through, I'm sure, you know, you're not gonna just leave this, let it die. Mm-hmm. So at first I wasn't real too uh, quick to go for it. And then after two or three days, I said to him, yeah, okay, let's go down. Right, Greg, this is where you come in. I mean, you're interested just because your father was interested in the snakes. Did you just follow it with him? Or at what point did you think, well, come on, let's do something about this? Well, I, I became aware of it around about October, November of last year. Now, I was aware of his interest in nature, uh, giant squids as a boy, stories he told me. Uh, and I knew he had some interest in, in uh, snakes. Mm-hmm. I had no idea until a, a, about October of last year the depth of his research, and mm-hmm. it is immense what he has. And you thought, well, why, why just let that lie there? Let's do something about it. And decided to book your flights and take yourself out there. How difficult was it to set up an exhibition like an expedition like that to, to head out to the Amazon? It, it was hard work. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a holiday. Mm-hmm. It was tough. Yeah, everything. Uh, Everything had to be planned weeks, maybe six weeks in advance. Um, we had the support of the Peruvian government. Um, we actually wrote a proposal to the president, uh, Garcia Perez, who had one of his ministers contact us and gave us all the assistance we needed. And then it became a whole logistical and planning exercise. We made contact with uh, a f- what they call a fixer in Lima, and uh, guides and interpreters on the ground in the Amazon mm. and everything pretty went really smoothly, actually. Yeah. It couldn't have gone better. Yeah. But people must be doing this all the time, going out to try and prove that these 40-metre snakes exist. I mean, so what, what, what is it about you that they wanted to support you in this whenever you went out there? Well, I, I took a, a summary of the information that, the, you know, that my father had amassed and I sent it to National Geographic and uh, the government officials in Peru. And I thought, you know, maybe something will come back, maybe we'll get a polite message, maybe nothing. But within 48 hours, we had uh, a senior editor in Washington, National Geographic, and uh, a minister in 
of ecotourism, you know, contacting us from the London Embassy and things just snowball, just snowball from, there. from there. It hasn't stopped, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. My goodness, and you must have been fit enough to do it in the first place. Um, <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? But you must have thought, because not everybody would take a chance like that, because you must be in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I'm trying, I'm trying to, looking at the pictures here, I mean, you must feel fit enough to do that. If we'd have gone down in the plane, we'd still be trying to get out. Mm, you wouldn't have got out, because one of those anacondas would have coiled itself around you. <laughs> I was telling the listeners that that's what they do. They, they coil themselves around you and squeeze you to death. Is that what they do? Um, actually, an anaconda re- it doesn't actually squeeze it, sort of tightens its grip so you can't breathe out anymore. Right. You're not able to breathe in, but it doesn't actually crush you. Mm. It just tightens and tightens till finally you can't breathe properly anymore. <sighs> Sounds pleasant. Right, OK, we're going to talk a wee bit more about it. I'm going to take a break. I was going to ask the listeners to come up with a song that we could play in between just to give us a wee breather here. <laughs> um, but I didn't have to because, like, there's one just sitting there. Duran Duran and Union of the Snake. We're coming back to you in a wee second. Mike Warner is with me, 73 years old, headed out to check out if there was such a thing as a, a giant 40-metre anaconda. He's come back with proof with his son, Greg. We're going to find out a wee bit more about it after this. Wait there. Itchy 105, a quarter to one. Good afternoon to you. Mike and Greg Warner with me now. Um, father and son from Lisburn who um, are telling us all about their pursuit of evidence of a real 40 metre snake. 40 metres would be from where to where. I mean, just, just to try and picture it, Mike. Where would it, give us an idea of that one. That's 131 feet. I can't see anything 131 feet. A snake. My God. And what was the diameter? 